effect. There is a larger reality behind the issue of policing, crime, and race that remains a taboo topic. The problem on black and black crime is an uncomfortable truth, but unless we acknowledge it, we won't get very far in understanding patterns of policing. Every year, approximately 6,000 blacks are murdered. That's a number higher than white and Hispanic murder victims combined, even though blacks are only 13% of the national population. Blacks of all ages are killed at six times the rate of whites and Hispanics combined. In Los Angeles, a typical city, blacks between the ages of 20 and 24 die at a rate 20 to 30 times the national mean. Who's killing them? Not white civilians and not the police, but other blacks. The astronomical black death by homicide rate is a function of the black crime rate. Black males between the ages of 14 and 17 commit homicide at 10 times the rate of white and Hispanic male teenagers combined. Black males of all ages commit homicide at eight times the rate of whites and Hispanics and 12 times the rate of whites alone. The police could end all use of lethal force tomorrow and it would have at most a negligible effect on the black death by homicide rate. Moreover, the percentage of blacks among civilians killed by the police, 26%, is far less than what the black crime rate would predict, since police shootings are going to occur most often in neighborhoods where cops are confronting violent, armed criminals, and people resisting arrest. 40% of all cop killers over the last decade have been black even though, again, blacks are only 13% of the national population. Standard anti-cop ideology, whether emanating from the ACLU or the university, holds that law enforcement actions are racist if they don't mirror population data. New York City illustrates why this benchmarking rule is so misguided. Blacks are 23% of New York City's population, but they commit 75% of all shootings, 70% of all robberies, and 66% of all violent crime. Add Hispanic shootings, and you count, account for 98% of all illegal gunfire in the city. This means that every time the police are called out on a shots fired call, they are inevitably going to minority neighborhoods and looking for minority suspects. The police don't wish for this. They hope against hope every time they're called out that for once they will be confronting a white suspect, but the numbers are in there against them. Whites in New York City are about 33, 34% of the population. They commit 2% of all shootings and 4% of all robberies. These disparities are mirrored in city after city. Now, this incidence of crime means that innocent black men have a much higher chance of being stopped by the police because they match the description of a suspect than white men. Now, who are some of the victims of elevated urban crime? On March 11th, 2015, as protesters were once again converging on the Ferguson Police Department, demanding the resignation of the entire department, a six-year-old boy named Marcus Johnson was gunned down a few miles away in a St. Louis park, the victim of a drive-by shooting. No one protested his killing. Al Sharpton didn't show up to demand a federal investigation. Few people outside of his immediate community even know his name. Last year, in Baltimore, 10 children under the age of 10 were gunned down in drive-by shootings. In Cleveland in September of 2015, three children, five and younger, were gunned down in drive-by shootings. In November, 
a nine-year-old in Chicago was lured into an alley and killed by his father's gang enemies. The father refused to cooperate with the police. In August 2015, a nine-year-old girl was doing her homework in her mother's bedroom and was killed by a bullet that penetrated the house. Such mindless vi violence seems almost to be regarded as normal, given the lack of attention it would receive from the same people who would be out in droves if any of those victims had been shot by a police officer. As horrific as such shootings are, crime rates were much higher 20 years ago. In New York City in 1990, for example, there were 2,245 homicides. In 2014, there were 333, a drop of 85%. New York's crime drop is the steepest in the nation, but crime has fallen at a historic rate nationwide as well, by about 40% since the early 1990s. The greatest beneficiaries of that crime drop have been minorities. In New York, over 10,000 minority males are alive today who would have been dead had homicide rates remained at their early 1990s levels. What is behind this historic crime drop? A policing revolution that began in New York City and spread nationally. Starting in 1994, the NYPD top brass embraced the radical idea that the police can actually prevent crime, not just respond to it. They started obsessively gathering and analyzing crime data on a daily and eventually an hourly basis. They looked for patterns and strategized about tactics to try to quell crime outbreaks as they were emerging. Equally importantly, for the first time, they held commanders actually accountable for what was happening in their jurisdictions. Department leaders started meeting on a weekly basis with precinct commanders to grill them on crime patterns on their watch. These weekly accountability sessions came to be known as ComStat. They were ruthless, high-tension affairs. Sometimes chairs were thrown because the emotions and stakes were so high. If a commander was not fully informed about every local crime outbreak and ready with a strategy to combat it, his career was in severe jeopardy. Comstat created a sense of urgency about crime fighting that has never left the NYPD. For decades, the traditional rap against the police was that they ignored crime in minority neighborhoods. Comstat keeps the police focused like a laser beam on where people are most being victimized, and that's in minority communities. Comstat spread nationwide. Departments across the country now send officers to emerging crime spots to try to interrupt criminal behavior before it happens. No other government program has come close to data-driven policing successes and economic stimulus. Welfare, forget about it. If you want to turn communities around, you have got to bring down crime. In New York City, businesses that had shunned previously drug-infested neighborhoods now set up shop there, offering residents choice in shopping and jobs for local workers. Senior citizens felt safe to go out to the store or the post office to pick up their social security check. Children could ride their bikes on sidewalks without their mothers worried that they would be shot. But the crime victories of the last two decades are now in jeopardy, thanks to the falsehoods of the Black Lives Matter movement. There are signs that law and order and the moral support for such order are breaking down. Police operating in inner city neighborhoods now find themselves routinely surrounded by cursing, jeering crowds when they make a pedestrian stop or try to arrest a suspect. Sometimes bottles and rocks are thrown. Cops are worried about becoming the latest racist cop of the week and possibly losing their livelihood thanks to an incomplete cell phone video that inevitably fails to show the antecedents to their own use of force. Officer use of force is never lovely to see. But the public is clueless about how hard it is 
to subdue somebody who is determined to resist arrest. Cops will tell you it can take five to six officers. As a result of the anti-cop campaign of the last two years and the resulting pushback on the streets, officers in urban areas are cutting back on precisely the type of policing that is responsible for our crime drop.